Good morning. Let's start with our doxology. It won't be on the screen, but you know it from heart. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now we're going to sing number 394 out of the hymnal. 394, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. <clears throat> what a fellowship, what a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, leaning to cure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you here. What a beautiful day it is. I'm just say welcome to any visitors who are here. I see a lot of new faces. Glad y'all are here this morning. A few other faces, uh, young folks here visiting. So glad you're here. If you haven't, maybe grab a visitor card and just fill that out, and you can drop it in the basket just so we know who you are here and love to uh, say thank you for coming. <clears throat> I wanted to say a couple things <clears throat> about last week. Thanks to everybody who brought food. We had a fellowship meal, and that was great. And I know it's a lot of effort, so many folks for desserts and sides, so that was a fun time. I look forward to doing that again. Usually we do it about every uh, three, three to six months. Uh, upcoming some activities, a fall festival. That's a big event for us to really uh, reach out to some of our neighbors and friends. Focus on just fun with the children, really. It's going to be November 9th across the road in the yard of the Parsonage with Bouncy House and good food. Uh, some, some lunch meals there at 11 o'clock on September, I'm sorry, October, November, <laughs> December. Which one would you like? No. It's actually going to be November the 9th, Saturday at 11. And then there's a ladies fall craft night on October 21st. So hopefully you guys take a look at that, put that on your calendar. And definitely on the fall festival, think about your neighbors. I think especially with children, um, some of the young kids, a lot of fun. But who can you invite to that? I wanted to update you guys on um, the Kenya mission work. That There was a gentleman who spoke here a couple weeks ago. Um, unfortunately, Billy Kay and I weren't able to be here, but we saw some of it online. And just in a compelling, um, I guess, just ministry of what he's doing in Kenya. They don't have clean water. They're working on um, some, uh, some changes. They've gotten uh, clean water, but they're feeding thousands of people with just bread. And they have a bakery that does the bread, but their power fluctuates. So he's trying to raise money for a generator. And just to up inform you, there's been, uh, you know, from our church, individuals has given $7,000 so far, and that money will be sent um, soon to Kenya. And then the church here is actually considering how we can add them to our missions work. Uh, and send some regular support to encourage uh, the people that they're helping in, in a remote area of Kenya. So keep that in your prayers. Uh, and then I did want to mention um, some special guests. I said young people. I have to call them out. We're so blessed to have Faith back with Murray and, and Jamie here for a weekend from college and four of her friends. Two from Missouri and two from Texas. Never been to Middle Tennessee or Nashville. So I just had to embarrass them. Glad y'all are here. <laughs> 
So anyway, thanks for coming to church this morning with us. We love you all. Let's continue our worship. All right, so our first hymn is number 190, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You may not even have to turn for these words. 190 is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And 345 is It is Well with My Soul. So 190, then 345. Let's stand together and sing God's faithfulness in each of our lives. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the sin even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with soul. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll have our scripture reading and our opening prayer now. Good morning. Thank you, Murray. That is one of my very, very favorites. I appreciate that. The reading this morning before the opening prayer will come from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who hear prayer. To all you, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your, at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for you so have prepared it. Your water, it furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year you crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you grateful, Lord, for this day, this opportunity to be together on this first day of the week. We thank you, God, for all those who are here in attendance with us this morning, all those who are joining us online. Father, we pray that you would be with us in our worship this morning. We pray as Murray leads us in song, we pray as Adam brings us our lesson, that we would be attentive, our hearts would be open, Lord. We would hear, sing songs of praises with joy. We would ask that your word pierces our heart, allows us, Lord, to be fulfilled, prepares us, Lord, to go out into the world and take this message, take the good news to everybody we come in contact with. Father, we are so grateful for the leadership in this church, for all of its members. Lord, we, are, we ask, God, that you continue to guide us and direct us, Father, Help us, Lord, 
in each and every day, each and every minute, each and every second, to attempt to become more righteous, just as Christ was on this earth. Father, again, we just ask that you have our minds, our ears, and our hearts open during this worship service today, and we ask that everything we would do would be pleasing to you. And we ask all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's sing number 203, 203. We gather together to celebrate who God is, all he has done, his faithfulness, his provision for us in every way. The chief provision is the gift of his son. The gift of his son, he, son of God, Jesus, in the world, living in it purely, experiencing every temptation we've experienced, but living perfectly. And so we turn our minds towards the feast that's set before us, the communion. In a moment, we'll have the, the bread and the cup. But we have an amazing Savior. Let's sing this to prepare our hearts and our minds and to worship. Man of sorrows, what a name For the Son of God who came Ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then anew this song will sing, hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. And we have been studying the past few weeks um, on uh, from the chapter or the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts of the Disciples, the Acts of God in the early church. And We've been in chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So if you'll open your Bibles or open your device to Acts chapter 14. Uh, we, we're going to study today about the followers of Jesus. The first followers, let's say, some of the first followers, and their devotion to Jesus. And I just think as we prepare to celebrate this, and let us know, we want everyone to have... Uh, the bread and the cup. So if you happen to walk in and miss that at the back, raise your hand. We'll get it to you. Uh, we got, okay. I think everybody's good. Um, we do celebrate. This is a time of celebration. It's a time of communion. It's a time of being together as a community in a special way that's so rich and so deep and so connected with, uh, with what God is doing and what he has done. But it just makes me think, as I look at chapter 14, particularly um, chapter 14, verse 19. 
And these people are following the Jesus that we're all following, right? But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, I consider myself a follower of Jesus, but I can't remember the last time that I was stoned and people thought I was dead. Stoned and and thought, you know, I I think this kind of persecution and suffering is foreign to me, foreign to us perhaps, but I want to be outspoken like these followers were. And I think as a church, God's calling us to speak the truth and to stand up and speak the name of Jesus and help people apply it to their lives, regardless of what it's met with, because it is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we share in this suffering Savior, the Son of God, the Son of Man. We share and we remember that it's a victory feast, right? But there was massive suffering, excruciating, painful, crucifixion, death, burial, and the resurrection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this feast today. We remember that Jesus gave us instructions. Do this in remembrance of me. And we love to remember Jesus. We love to know that he is with us here in this place. The Spirit of Christ is here in a powerful way giving us strength, preparing us for the future, calling our hearts onward. So we do take this bread. We take it in faith, knowing that the body of your son Jesus was pierced for our iniquities. And you raised him up. So we want to live in that suffering and in that victory today. In Jesus' name, amen. And this is the rest of the story. This is the rest of the story about how Paul, when he was dragged out of the city, they thought he was dead. Verse 20. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up, entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that, Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our our heroes this morning, our hero is Jesus, your son. But the first people that followed him so closely, as closely as they could, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they knew many tribulations. They had they were beaten. They were persecuted so strongly. So I'm thankful that this story ends with so much hope and healing and proclamation of the good news. And I pray that we could rededicate ourselves as we drink this cup to remember the suffering, the blood that was shed, but also the joy that comes in communion and and the, the hope to which you've called us in your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our 
hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. And we are called, we, we stand up from the table of, of the Lord's Supper, and we think about how we are called into the world and how we can give, how we can give back. So sometimes we show a slide of the different missions we have, but they're also listed on your bulletin, the ways we give back to the world. We give not from something that belongs to us. Everything belongs to God, but we share what we have for the good of the world and for the glory of his name. Let's pray as we give. Heavenly Father, there's so many good things you're doing. You are the God of all goodness. And so help us just to catch the wave, to catch the momentum of your Holy Spirit as you blow the winds of change and transformation and healing and hope and, and food to the hungry and clothing to the naked and freedom for prisoners. As you go throughout the globe doing those things, help us to jump in and to give generously. You've been so generous with us, Father. Help us to open our hearts and our wallets and our treasury so that we can give sacrificially to the purposes that bring you so much glory and that bring so much help to this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, we've got some awesome children here at this church. And they have a chance now to go to children's worship. So we're going to sing Shout Hallelujah as they come down front. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys have a great time. <laughs> we'll see you a little bit later. I don't think I have to encourage them to have a good time. Awesome. All right, people. That's not the church of tomorrow. That's the church of today. <laughs> so let's get ready. Keep up with their joy and excitement. Hmm. Hmm. Let's sing number 822. We'll see if we can get two verses in this great hymn. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Number 822. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When 
At the cross my Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's stand for the third verse. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe Rich is eternal and blessing supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. Please have a seat. Today's reading will come from Acts, Acts 14, 8 through 22. Acts 14, 8 through 22. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looked intently at him, and seeing that he had faith, made him well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barmas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, who was at, whose, temple, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garland to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men who like nature with who like men of who like <laughs> men of like nature with you. And we being bringing you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who has made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains and heavens and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices, sacrifices, to, the, sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch, Iconium, and persuaded the crowds. They stoned Paul and, Barnum, Paul and dra dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around about him, he rose up and entered the city, and the next day went with Barnabas to, to, to Derbe. When they, heard, when they had preached the gospel to the city, they had made many disciples. 
They returned to Lystra, to Iconia, to, the, to Antioch, strengthening, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Thank you, Andrew. Let's begin with prayer this morning. Lord, thank you so much for life, for creating us in your image, Father, giving us this honor, this opportunity to bear your image in the first place. Thank you for forgiveness of sin that we have in Christ and the opportunity to bear your image rightly, Father, not as sinful people, but as people who are practicing righteousness. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, Father, that you have not left us here just as a performance to see how well we do, Father, but you have sealed us who believe with your Holy Spirit, Father, so that we may know we have a hope, a sure hope, Father, that takes us all the way into your presence, Father, and leads us there, and we believe that your Spirit sanctifies us, purifies us, makes us truly holy, Father, so may we never throw away the confidence that you have bought for us, but may we walk faithfully, Father, believing all that you have done, joyful in that, Father. Anyone who is here, Father, who has never trusted you with their life, Father, may they see that joy, that hope, and that full, complete assurance that we can have in you, Father. May they be convicted in their heart, Father, to seek after that, Father, knowing that it is a gift to all who call upon your name, Father, that you are ready to give that. Father, help us to take a look at our lives, Father, and to see the calling that you have put on us, Father. See the calling that you called Paul and Barnabas on, Father, that they were faithful in the midst of so many things that many of us would, would shrink away at, Father. And they pressed on. Father, may we take a look at the doors you have opened for us rather than asking you to open doors that we want to walk through. May we see what you have opened for us, the path you have laid, Father, and walk in it and be faithful, and more so to trust that you are faithful, and that you are loving, that all your paths truly are loving and faithful, Father, because you are there, you lead us, your spirit leads us deeper into truth. Be with us today, Father, may our hearts be ready, and prepared to receive your word, may you prick us with your word, Father, work in power in this place, in Christ's name, amen. Some of you may have heard the name Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael uh, was a missionary to India in the late 1800s and then uh, through the turn of the 20th century and on into the 1900s. Uh, she was uh, born in, uh, in Ireland and she grew up uh, in a Christian family and became convicted for uh, teaching, sharing her faith, and, and even taught people in Belfast, Ireland there. Uh, and so she decided or was convicted from this moment in life that she wanted to enter the mission field. And what she wanted to do specifically was she wanted to go and she wanted to teach the Bible to people. She wanted to share her faith. And so she first went to Japan and then she went to India and, and she spent six years in, in India. And as she's there, you have to kind of understand, okay, th put yourself into the shoes of someone like that. If you're entering the mission field as a young person, she was single at the time, you think about, okay, I've got these expectations of what ministry life is going to look like or what, what being a missionary is going to look like. And so she goes to India with those expectations. But as she's there, she starts to learn about some things that are happening that are very dark. She learns about these parents who will, will commit their daughters to these temples to become prostitutes at a very young age and to spend the rest of their life there. And she sees this happening with some of the religions that are there in, in India, and she's convicted, and she begins praying fervently for this. She meets this girl named Prina, a seven-year-old girl. I mean, think about this, a seven-year-old girl who had been abandoned by her parents to live at this religious temple for the rest of her life to serve as a temple prostitute. Seven years old. This little girl escapes the temple and comes back. She already has a relationship with Amy. And she comes and she's begging her, please take me in, adopt me. 
This is not what Amy had signed up for as a missionary. She wanted to teach the Bible. She wanted to share her faith with people to unreached people. Now here's this girl asking her to basically be her mother. And she does that. Over the course of time, more girls find out about her, escape from these temples, and they come. And she eventually sees there's this huge need, and she starts something with some other people called the Donover Fellowship. And over the course of her time there in India, they end up taking in over 100 girls to live at this place. And eventually they open up a home for orphaned boys as well. And I want you to think about that. In order to be faithful to that calling, that path, that door that God had opened for her to serve, what did she have to do? She had to die to her own expectations of what missionary life was going to be like. And that's something that she did. She experienced that death, that self-denial, death of what I want to do, what I expect to do, even in godly work. A uh, young girl wrote to her one time, uh, you can think about this, this girl, maybe a teenage girl, a college-age girl who's thinking about entering the mission field, and she writes to Amy Carmichael and says, what is missionary life like? Expecting some kind of glorious answer, you know. And here's what Amy writes, these are famous words. Missionary work is simply a chance to die. You're sure you want to become a missionary. And she had experienced that, dying to herself, dying to her own expectations in order to fulfill what God had planned for her. That's a theme that you see all through the book of Acts. When you look at people who are following Christ, following this example, spreading the message of Christ, they had to die to their expectations, die to their dreams, to their hopes, to their aspirations, because Christ was their life now. And if he had not been their life, you wonder, how would the gospel ever have been spread? if These people had not committed to doing this. That's a theme you see through the book of Acts. We're concluding this series today in Acts 10 through 14 about following the will of the Spirit. And a theme that you see in Acts is that God opens doors and lays paths for people. And they follow it, trusting the hand of the Spirit to guide them in that. And so if we're going to become Spirit-led people, that's a theme we really need to soak up. To pay attention when God has placed a calling on my life, has opened a path, even though maybe I want this path. I want this door. He says, this is the path I have for you. To be able to follow that, to trust in that. It's what it takes to be spirit-led people. The main point that I want you to really, to, I want to urge you toward as we study this text this morning is a, is a phrase that comes from Psalm 25 that says, all the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful. All the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful, which sounds so good, so sweet, so comforting, so poetic. But think about what all the paths looks like. It means no matter what comes on that path, he's loving and faithful. I want you to hold on to that as we go through this text this morning. Acts chapter 14, Paul will later say of his ministry in Acts 20, verse 24, he'll say, I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. I consider my life of no value. Christ is my life. This is the kind of person we're reading about here in this moment, which in chapter 13 and 14 is, is his first missionary journey. And that principle about his life, it gets put on display here. Verse 1 begins, In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. And you have to understand that they are hundreds of miles from Jerusalem now. They're up north of the Mediterranean Sea in, in modern-day Turkey, what used to be Asia Minor. And so they're, they're not close to this Jewish territory. There's Jews here, there's synagogues here, but there's also many Greeks, and there's many different ideas that are out here. In verse 2, it says, The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned 
their minds against the brothers. And we saw that in the last chapter. So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord. Who did what? Who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. That's a short phrase to say God had their back. He had called them here and he's there with them on this. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derby and to the surrounding countryside. So they're kind of out in the countryside here now. There they continued preaching the gospel. I want you to imagine this. Imagine you're, you're on the mission field. And all of a sudden you catch wind that not only some of the people you're preaching to are rejecting your message, they're, they're plotting to kill you in a very violent way, in a very uh, religiously ritualistic way. You're going to want to get out of there? Yeah, I probably would. That's exactly what Paul and Barnabas do. They find out about this. But I want you to, to hold on to that because Murray's already alluded to it that this is, this is a preview of what's about to happen. So there's maybe this, this tension, this anxiety that's coming for them. But then you come to verse 18. This is really the heart of this text. It says, In Lystra a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet. He had never walked and had been lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke. After looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and began to walk around. Now that's not out of the ordinary for the book of Acts up to this point. Many people have been healed by the apostles. And we saw just a few verses earlier that God is testifying to this message by enabling to do these things to prove that this is authentic. But Paul is not in Jewish territory now. He's out in the countryside of Greek territory. And you have to imagine that, that ideas of religion are a little bit different in the countryside than they are in the city, especially in this predominantly Greek territory. And so instead of recognizing and, and coming and saying, wow, the God you serve is awesome, or tell us about him, Here's what these people say. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. They misinterpreted what's happening. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the town, he brought bulls and wreaths to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. Imagine being Paul and Barnabas in this moment. What in the world is happening? And it says, The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their clothes when they heard this and rushed into the crowd shouting, People, why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you. And we are proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God. And this is a quotation from Exodus and from Psalm 146, the Spirit enabling him to speak. He says, this is the God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. And he says, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way, although he did not leave himself without a witness since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with your food and your hearts with joy. And essentially, he's telling these people who have many different gods for many different things, a God of, of fertility of the land, a God of fertility in marriages, a God of wealth, a God of this, this, and that, a God of the seas, a God of the sun. He's saying, listen, it's all one living God who has been blessing you with all of these things. Even though you haven't trusted in Him, He has still been sending rain to give you crops, to fill you with joy. He has not left Himself without a witness in His creation. But it says, in spite of saying these things, that they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. 
I want you to imagine if God calls you to a, to a work, you would expect pretty good success, right? If you go back to the beginning of this missionary journey in Acts 13, you see that it says they're all praying and fasting together in Antioch, and the Holy Spirit says, set apart Paul and Barnabas. Now you would think if the Holy Spirit literally speaks or convicts everyone in the crowd, however it happened, to say, these two men, I have a work for them. You would think if you're one of those men about to go on that, there's going to be some success coming, right? Because God has prepared the way. But this has become a disaster, a total disaster. In fact, you could probably imagine Paul and Barnabas are having to reject the temptation. We don't read that this is there, but you can imagine just as human beings, someone giving you praise and glory, worshiping you. They had to reject that. He says that's not really even a thought for them, and yet that would have been a reality. But it gets worse. Verse 19 says, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, which is the place they had just been earlier. And when they won over the crowds who were already kind of in an uproar anyway, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. And after the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went into the town. And the next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. I want you to imagine being Paul in that moment. Imagine being Barnabas in that moment. Barnabas was a man who, we read, when Paul was converted, people were afraid of him because Paul used to persecute Christians. And Barnabas is the man who comes in and literally takes him by the arm and says, he's converted to Christ. He's encouraging Paul and he's encouraging all of these other people. That's what his name means, son of encouragement. And Imagine being Barnabas and watching this man be stoned and left for dead. And I want you also to imagine Paul, who back in Acts chapter 7, when we first read about him, where is he? What's he doing? He's standing there collecting cloaks from people who are stoning Stephen. Stephen was one of these men who was set apart for a special work in the church. He's preaching and convicting the people that they have killed Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and they stone him to death, and Stephen prays, Lord, don't hold this against them. And Paul, at that time, is one of the enemies of God's people, of, of the followers of Christ. And he's watching this happen, and at that time in his life, he's in full agreement with it. That's what the text tells us. Now imagine, perhaps, that coming back to his mind in this moment when now stones are coming at him. This is the cost of this life change that he has now made. He used to be on the side of, of power. Now he's on the side of followers of Christ, and the stones are coming at him. What do you imagine is going through his mind in this moment? We get a taste, really a glimpse, of what might have been going through his mind because we get a response from him. In just a few verses down, it says in verse 21, after they had preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch. In other words, they didn't retreat. They went back to these places, kept preaching. And it says they kept strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and telling them, and here's this really only quotation we get from Paul. And so it's the best glimpse we have at his response at just being stoned. He says, it's necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, this is the way. This is the path. This is part of it. Remember, I count my life of no value in the cause of Christ. If I'm serving Him, He is my life. I want you to reflect on that for a moment. This is the door that God has opened for them. It says that in verse 27 that speaks about that they came back to where they had started in Acts 13. They encouraged the people, speaking how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is the door He opened for them, the path that He had for them. And yet all of these things happen. Rejection, total heretical misunderstanding, 
and then stoning him and leaving him for dead. And all Paul has to say about it is it's necessary to advance the kingdom of God. It's necessary to go through these things to enter the kingdom of God, to testify of his grace. I want to bring this kind of to, to, to your minds as we're thinking about what might happen to me in my own path. As I think about that phrase, all the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful. Does that mean I might get stoned? That might, does that mean people might totally misunderstand me? I want to share kind of a humorous story. Maybe some of you have heard this before. Some of you in the room may have even been there when this happened. When I was in, uh, in high school, in the youth group, our youth group decided to go to a haunted house. And I'm not a big fan of haunted houses. This is the only time I've ever been. And we get in this line, and you pay $20 to, to get in, which is a total ripoff. And so we go in, and we're waiting in this line, and you keep hearing this banging sound. And it's getting dark. And you get up to this door, and speaking of an open door, the door opens. And there's this giant man sitting in there at a table. It's, it's very dark and dingy. And he's got this mask on. It's, all, it's very demonic, I think. And so he's sitting there, and he's got this axe or something. I don't even know what he had in his hand, some kind of death weapon. And he's banging this on the table. And when, when the door opens, he stands up, and he starts walking. And I realize in this moment what I just paid $20 for from picking up hay and sweating. You know, I just blew this money on this. And I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, the path through this haunted house lies right past this guy. You know which direction I went? I turned around and walked out. I said, I got better things to do with my life. And the people with me walked out as well. And they said, you can't get your money back. I said, I really don't care. And that was the end of that story for me. And that's kind of a, maybe a ridiculous example. I'm not comparing our path in life to, to a, what I view as an, an unholy uh, enterprise ripoff uh, racket or whatever you want to call it. But I, but I want you to think about your path in life, following faithfully what God has called you to. How many times do we reject a calling that God has put on our life because we see the path that he has for us, and it doesn't look good. Or maybe at least it just doesn't look like what we want. We would rather this path. This one looks so much better. It fits with what we think our talents are, our skill set, our aspirations. But he's calling me to do this. And how many times do we sit here so anxious about following God's will, waiting for Him to open a door, we're so confused, and He's opened a door, He's laid a path, we just don't want it. Or flip that around. How many times do we enter on a path, but then it starts to get hard, the pressure ramps up, hardship comes along, and we say, all the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful? Really? Really? Is, is this right? Is this part of it? I want you to think about that in the context of your own life. There's a story that, uh, not a story, it just happened. There's a family in our uh, homeschool group who the, the, the husband in this family, the father, I just had lunch with him a few months ago. He went on a mission trip recently with some young men uh, to Nepal. He's in his late 30s. And they go to Nepal to get up into the Himalayas to preach to unreached people groups. And you think, man, that's a, that's a great cause, right? That's something I want to be doing. Preach to people who've never heard the gospel. But when he goes, his wife tells us that she's not going to be able to have any contact with him until he gets back. He's going to be wandering in the Himalayas somewhere. She's going to have no idea where he is, and she's got two kids at home, homeschooling them. And then she gets word that when they were going up the path they were heading for in the Himalayas, she gets word from someone who's connected with another person there that they weren't able to go because there's been a landslide. And now all that she knows is that he's somewhere in the Himalayas sleeping in a hostel. She's in distress and tears thinking about this. Not because she doesn't want her husband to do mission work or to preach, but because she's worried about his life and because she has no contact with him. I want you to think about that. The cause of Christ, truly, when we say Christ is my life, He owns me. But when things like that happen, are we tempted to say, 
That's crazy. There's so many people here who could hear about the gospel. Why do you have to go put your life in jeopardy for something like that? You wonder if some of the other people are thinking about this when Paul is stoned and left for dead, dragged out of the city. Do we think about faithfulness in terms of what is this actually going to cost my life? And so many times I think the reason we struggle to have to have a, a, a firm guidance of what is the Spirit doing in me? We, we talk about this and, and we're confused. How does the Spirit lead? How does He speak? How does He guide us? And so many times I think we're confused because we're trying to take that and squeeze it into our already stuffed life. With so many other things that we prioritize. We're consumed by many of these things. We're just trying to add the Spirit in, but that's not how it works. For these people... That was their life. Everything else they left behind, that was the cost of discipleship. And they paid that cost. They were willing. I want you to think about this. I want to close with this moment. We opened talking about Amy Carmichael as someone who died to these expectations and fulfilled this calling of, of taking in these orphaned girls, but that's not the end of her story. You would think someone who did that is just going to be full of experiencing richness for the rest of her life. But here's what happened. She ended up having a fall, having an accident later in life. And she ended up being bedridden for the last 20 years of her life. Now, doesn't that seem a little unfair? I mean, here's the prayer. I mean, think about that in human terms. We, th we think so many times in, in many different ways, but think about that. Here's a person who has given her life to ministry, to mission work, and her expectations change when God has this mission for her and she, she takes that and then she ends up crippled and in a bed for 20 years of her life. But you know what she did in those 20 years? She started writing. She started writing devotional books, materials. She ended up writing over 30 books that people can still read today. that are still blessing people today over 100 years later. Maybe that was a calling that God had for her even though maybe it wouldn't have been her choice. Here's one of the things she wrote, and it references this passage in Psalm 25 that I mentioned. All does not mean all except the paths I am walking in now. She was reading that verse, all the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful. She was reflecting on it. She said, when it says all, it doesn't mean all except for the path I'm walking right now, or Nearly all, except for this especially difficult and painful path. All must mean all. So all our paths, with their unexplained perplexity, their sheer mystery, your path, my path, with its mess, they are his paths on which he will show himself loving and faithful. Nothing else, nothing less. If I'm going to read that verse in Psalm 25 and believe that it's true, that's what it's got to mean. All means all. That he is loving and faithful. <clears throat> Come what may, no matter what happens. So I want you to think about this as we're concluding this. What's that going to mean for your life? Maybe it means that your plans of being financially independent come crashing to the ground because of some circumstance of life and you end up having to become dependent on other people to help you. Maybe that's something that God is, is leading you to and teaching you about your own heart. You think about maybe there's this mission, this cause that you want to pursue, and he has something totally different from you. Even though this one really is a good calling, it's a godly thing, but what is his path that he's opened for you? Because the purpose that we see in Acts that they are encouraged to do is to just follow and they become so unified with the Spirit that it says later on in Acts 15, they have this comment where it says, we did this because it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, it seemed good to us as well. We're following Him wherever He has called us. There's a temptation to look at these people in the Bible and hold them up on a pedestal. Yet they were ordinary people. Oswald Chambers, a Christian writer, many of you have probably read his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. He says this, All of God's people are ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by the purpose He has given them. 
follow in his purpose for us. He has an extraordinary thing to accomplish in us that we could never accomplish in our own strength. So we don't need to rely on our own strength. We don't even need to envision things that we can do on our own strength because that's not his purposes. Because who gets the glory for that then? We do. If God is going to receive the glory, it has to be the path that he has called us on, even though it looks impossible for us, because it is impossible for us in our own strength. But that's what faithfulness to his calling looks like, where he receives all glory and praise, and other people come to know him through our witness, through the witness of our life. Think deeply about these things. All the paths of the Lord are loving and faithful, no matter what. Either I believe it or I don't. I believe it, and that's a high calling. It's a grand calling. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these examples in Scripture that we can read about, for these ordinary people. May we never idolize them or exalt them, Father, but just look at how they were seeking to follow clarify the paths that you have for us, Father, so that we may follow the path for this church and the path for us as individuals, Father, so that we may walk in it and so that we may delight in the fact that you have established our steps. We believe that and choose willingly to walk in that, knowing that your path is one on which you will prove yourself faithful, good, and powerful, ready to act, ready to lead, ready to mature us through whatever may come, ready to sanctify us and make us holy. Father, may we seek that path. Help us to see it, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Any ways to respond to a sermon like this? If you need prayer, we're here to pray for you. You've never testified to faith in Christ through this act of baptism, we can do that today. And a response for you may even just be a prayer, God, I trust you. I haven't been. I've tried. But I trust you. That's a response to a sermon like this. Listen to wherever God is, is leading you, whatever he is doing in your heart, and be faithful and humble and obedient to respond to that. Let's all stand and sing now. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry until I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let's turn over to number 282. Good. You're good. Okay. Let's sit down for just a moment here. Have a seat, please. <laughs> and here, one of the beautiful things that we get to see in the church is how the impact that happens in a family, the things that God does in a family, how it spills over. Hopefully that continues to spill over into other people. That's how the gospel spreads. See the joy of salvation spreading and catching. I think it's undeniable to see what's been happening in the Pendarvis family over this past year. And so to me, it's only natural that that Sam hasn't been asking questions about baptism just recently. But as I understand, it's it's been a conversation that's been continual on his heart. We have to accept this and, and honor when, when God puts a calling on, 
on someone's heart and says that it's just clear to me. I just want to obey. Mm-hmm. I'll seek to. So we're here to celebrate uh, with Sam today. One thing that you used to hear, I'm sorry I'm rambling so much, one thing you used to hear at weddings is, is uh, this kind of this, this emphasis that all the witnesses are there to, to help. You don't hear it as much, but that used to be a thing. You know, when, when people are getting married, you're, you're here in the presence of many witnesses. And the same thing is true in the church because a baptism is, is it's like a marriage ceremony. I'm, I'm uniting my life to the life of Jesus Christ. And it's a profession of faith, and it's a testimony to the rest of the church to say, and we're going to help. We're going to be there because this is part of this family. And so there's a calling not only on the Pendarvis home uh, to lead well in this, this faith, this path that you're stepping on, Sam, but also on the whole church to help, to encourage, to be there, to pour our own faith into him. So Sam, yeah, come up here for just a minute. I want to ask you a question. Now, I've, I've asked you just a couple of questions in the, in the past few weeks, but I just want to ask you a simple question. You don't have to be nervous. You can answer it however you want to answer it, whatever's in your heart, not mine, okay? Tell me, uh, well, if I can get this out. It's all tangled up. Okay. Tell me, who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? He means... A lot to me. Yes, that's the answer you told me the other day. I said, what does Jesus mean to you? And you said, a lot. And do you remember what you said when I asked it, what it was like seeing Jackie baptized? Do you remember what you said? Remember? I said, it must have been exciting to see that. And you said, 100%. 100%. And that struck me. So we're so excited with you. And who's baptizing you today? My dad as you today, yes, because he's the leader in your home, and he's going to lead you and set this example, all right, because you're on this journey together, all right. Let's, uh, yeah, let's sing some songs, if I can get a couple uh, deacons volunteers to come and, and help uh, lay this down, and then you can, uh, if everyone in the back can come forward uh, so that we can be closer, and if someone can go get the kids and bring them in here, all right. I know.
like I need. That thing is like. I think we'll put an L bracket at the bottom, come into the floor, and you know, just a couple quick screws that can be popped off real quick. But I don't like that bracket. Unless, unless there's something easier. Uh, L bracket for it, I think. That's I think it's the simplest and easiest and most. Well, the so most temporary, you know what I mean? Just well, so, so that it could do that, though, then we're going to have to have a, like, if we had a bad one, we're going to have to have a bad you know? Today would have been bad. We'd have yeah. been prepared. The catch is going to be when somebody sporadically right. comes up there and is, right. keep, keep a drill in that drawer. Yeah, or just keep it, like, right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah. I mean, or uh, wing nuts. Yeah, wing yeah nuts. that might be a good idea. Those would be easy. Say anything, Bubba? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Missouri, I, mean, I think they were pitiful yesterday. 
I think y'all that's y'all waste game y'all play. South Carolina probably. Hey. That's always too close. Yeah. 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 Y'all going across the street? Yeah. How we finally settled in? Man, I uh, went to play pool yesterday. With, I met a, a buddy down there. We were talking about Jesus. We were in the work room. Yeah. He had on flip flops. and I forgot how the conversation started, but we started talking about, you know, Jesus and stuff. We ended up shooting pool. Did you take him out? Yeah, I beat him. He beat me two out Did of you three. Hustle him a bit? <laughs> I, I said, hey, next time we need to. Put a uh, blue play for a dollar, a blue dollar up there. You know what I'm saying? I really played in. Yeah. I gotta have y'all over so we can shoot. Uh, you play pool? I'm not good, but I play a little bit. Yeah. It's, I didn't know it was that competitive and fun. It's, no. it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Sam. Yeah. We got a clubhouse. Yeah. We got an indoor pool. Somehow out. Hey, y'all come. Then they got a. They got like playgrounds for kids. So, see if y'all came over to eat or whatever. The kids are with